That's a fish you want to keep catching. You just, you don't quite get your belly full of it all the time. But this fish here, uh, even more so than those fish that you like to catch, just keeps getting on you more and more and more. You dream about them. You think about the next time you're going. You think about uh, new ways that you can fish for them. But anybody that's had a chance to fish for a moment, every guy that I know that has done all kinds of fishing, that has really experienced some nice salmon fishing, I don't know one guy that doesn't say, yeah, I have to agree that if I only have one to fish for, it has to be the Atlantic salmon. It has descended from the Ice Age to become, as Salmo Salar, the Atlantic salmon, what many sportsmen consider the noblest fish of all. This is the Miramichi River in New Brunswick, Canada. It is one of the home parks of Salmo Salar. Those who fish here will tell you that it's a special place. For Ted Williams, whose quest for fish and game has taken him to the five continents, and down hundreds of rivers and waterways, this is the one that always brings him back. Ted Williams' love for the Atlantic salmon is no sudden infatuation, but a long abiding romance that quickens his pulse and his step whenever the season is at hand. And now in the late fall, he's brought his son John Henry to scout the river, anticipating the fishing he will do here in the spring. For fishermen such as Ted Williams, the Atlantic salmon represents nobility of the highest rank. Its silvery leaps and tackle-bending runs are a challenge to his ability as an angler. Its finicky appetite and touchy disposition a challenge to his ability to tie flies. Its romantic life cycle over long ocean journeys to the spawning grounds where it was born perhaps five years before make it an epic fish story. The tarpon might be a better fighter, William says. The bonefish a faster swimmer. But for all things combined, there is no better opponent for the consummate angler than the Atlantic salmon. Now in the fall, after that mysterious migratory circuit that has taken them from these fresh waters into the Atlantic in places unknown, the salmon have come home. They have made it at last to these tranquil spawning waters far up the Miramichi, where they will create new numbers for the species, new converts to Salmo Solar. The home waters of the Atlantic salmon stretch across the North Atlantic from latitudes 41 to 60 degrees north in the United States and Canada, and 40 to 70 degrees north in Europe. It's a cold water fish an anadromous which developed at some prehistoric stage the ability to travel down the freshwater rivers of its birth into the salty ocean and back again. With uncanny accuracy, it returns to the same little stream or estuary that spawned it. The salmon begins much as the river, small and insignificant. The river is its sustainer. Here, spilling down out of the snowy mountains of Norway, the river provides a lavish dwelling place for the Baltic branch of the salmon family. The fish spawned here are a big and rugged variety, a match for the brawling, fast-flowing river. Heavy bait-casting gear is accepted tackle for sportsmen on Baltic rivers. Big, shiny spoons are often used as lures. If the thrill of a catch is any less than that felt by his fly-casting American counterpart, the difference is forgotten at the prospect of making a meal of a beauty such as this. From the day of its birth, the salmon is hungered after by a gallery of natural enemies. Its most deadly enemy, however, is man. Man with his despoiling of the waters, man with his poaching, man with his insatiable nets stretching across the mouths of rivers and out to sea. But here in Scotland, 
Commercial fishing is carefully controlled. Salmo Salah is a respected natural resource, and the fishermen whose job it is to satisfy the taste buds of a continent fish for it in the same acceptable way they have for centuries. For those who discover the great character of the Atlantic salmon, the quest is the same everywhere. Only the rituals vary. On streams in Scotland, the flycaster rules, and the ritual reaches the heights of formality. The fisherman goes to the mark in tweed jacket, cap, vest, and tie. His fly rod is as long as 13 feet. He roll casts of the longer rod and heavier line due to the closeness of river bush and trees. But no matter where he makes his quest, whether on the Baltic rivers or along the east coast of Canada and the northern United States, the sportsman's appreciation for the Atlantic salmon inevitably grows, and with it, his concern for the fish's good health. Ways have been sought to balance the scales against the havoc that was set in motion at the dawning of the Industrial Revolution. Artificial breeding became a reality years ago. Something worthwhile was bound to come of that. On the Miramichi River in New Brunswick, that something is the Miramichi Fish Culture Station. At the culture station, or hatchery, artificial spawning of the salmon normally begins during the last week of October or the first week of November, depending upon the season and the water temperature. This year, it has begun on the 25th of October. The fish have returned to the small pond into which they were released perhaps five years earlier. And in the spawning procedure, they are lured into crates in the river. Then, with nets, the fish are removed from the crates to a holding tank. The males are separated from the females, the hard from the soft. A hard fish is one which is not ready to spawn yet. The soft is one that is ready. One of the spawners selects a soft female and fertilizes it with one male. They spawn a second and a third female with the male and then fertilize with a second male. The second male is used as a safeguard against one which might not be fertile. The female is removed from the holding tank and then taken inside to the spawning area. The spawner extracts the eggs with his right hand, carefully kneading the fish's body with his fingers and thumbs. The pan of eggs is removed to the washing table where excess milk is removed from the egg. The pan of eggs is then transferred to metal trays which are placed in vats of water. This is known as the hardening process. Once hardened, the eggs are measured and the trays removed from this building to the main hatchery for winter incubation. Under carefully controlled conditions, the eggs are protected from the cold Canadian winter. Here, the salmon grows from stage to stage from a green egg to a fry, to advanced fry, to fingerlin, to yearling, or what is also called a par. He will remain a par to the age of two, at which time his colors change and he's called a smolt. He is now ready to migrate to sea. When he returns five years later, he will look like this, a full-grown salmon ready to spawn again. While their brothers in the hatchery are growing in comfort, the salmon spawned naturally on the Miramichi struggle through the winters. Their development is slower and more hazardous. Of perhaps 8,000 eggs spawned by the female salmon upriver, two might make it through the growing stages, survive the sea, and be back five or six years later for another spring. The Miramichi system is the focus of salmon fishing in Canada. The salmon season begins in mid-April. The runs are not as great then. They'll be much heavier in June. And the weather might be cold and rainy, but chances are Ted Williams will be there. Once resumed, the love affair Ted carries on for his favorite fish will not abate till season's end. He'll be on the river as much as eight hours a day, making a thousand casts. And more days than not, he'll be satisfied if he lands one fish. In a sense, it is angling in reverse. The Atlantic salmon has him hooked.
out to sea, had all the predators out there after him, and here he comes on his way back, and boom, I got him on a fly. The fish he lands on the Miramichi might only be a grilse, three or four years old and weighing five pounds. This fight is over quickly, but tougher fights will follow. The season has just begun. For a master fisherman like Ted Williams, the preparation is as painstaking as the fishing, the rehearsal as vital as the performance. At his cabin on the Miramichi, he and his longtime friend and guide, Roy Curtis, spend hours readying rods and line and weighting equipment. They apply felt stripping to the bottom of boots so that they'll be better able to navigate the algae-laden river rocks. Curtis is a New Brunswick native. He's been a guide since 1941. Guides are required by law on the rivers of New Brunswick, and they are invaluable. They know the water in its conditions and the dimensions of the private pools they are to avoid. Though Williams has his own pool below the cabin, he takes Curtis with him for scrimmages at other pools and on other rivers, the Restigouche, the Dungarvan, the Canes. To explore a bit, Williams says to try different water, different rigs. They enjoy a vast mutual respect. When I met Ted Williams, oh, that's back in 56, I think. He was there about a week, I guess. And I've been with him ever since. Well, I like Ted Williams because he was always awful good to me and a great companion, a dandy fellow to be with. And to fish, well, there's none better. Ted's equipment is his own autograph model, the top of the line at Sears. The backing he's applying is 20-pound Daquan line, about 150 yards of it. To that, he ties 80 or 90 feet of number 8 torpedo fly line, usually 6 to 8-pound test. He joins them with a wrap-over knot with a whip finish, and then coats the knot with nail polish. The leader will correspond closely to the weight of the fly line, Usually, it will be eight pound test. He'll use an eight and a half foot fly rod. In Ted's basement, his thick, facile athlete's fingers perform small miracles made of deer hair, red squirrels, bear, feathers, tinsel, flax, and floss. They are basically simple flies, Miramichi versions of the exotic English patterns, with names such as Dusty Miller, Silver Gray, Conrad, Black Dose. Part of the joy of all of it is the equipment that you can use on a salmon. You can cast beautiful flies at him. You can spend hours and hours and hours and hours tying them. Um, Always trying to tie a nicer one. But again, you go back to the, the flies you use in the Miramichi. They're really simple flies. In fact, all New Brunswick rivers, even the rest of Goosh, they use hair wing flies. They use uh, the, uh, the silver rat, the rusty rat, and one of the most popular flies, in fact, the most popular fly on the river, I would say, is a fly called a Conrad. And what's a Conrad? That's basically a dark fly. It has a little... Uh, I tie mine with, with gold wire, because I use small flies. The artificial delicacy he has created is less than half an inch long. The hook is just as tiny, a number six. That fly, that will really catch fish right there. The water is still too high in the pool below Williams's cabin. With a new day, he and Roy Curtis have elected to try elsewhere, to another pool Ted fishes. Ideally, Williams prefers pools three to five feet deep with a gravel or rock bottom. 
He would hope for the water to be running five to 10 miles an hour. It's temperature around 55 to 65 degrees. When it's too warm, the fish are not as active. The fishermen and the guide have gone through this many times before. For them, it's a team effort. Oh, God, yeah, I've been guiding for 32 years. I met an awful lot of fishermen in that time. We had a lot of good times together on the river, me and him. You know, we'd go up in a little tight place, just him and me. We'd be all over the country, I imagine, here. All the rivers, Cane's River, this river, the main river. Just him and I, you know, in some little tight pool. They have chosen a place called Swinging Bridge, a pool where 40 pounders have been caught, but not for a very long time. The preliminaries are over now. The contest is on. Once considered the most thoughtful of baseball hitters, Williams applies that same intensity and attention to detail to his fishing. For him, it's an art, and he revels in the practice of it. I can cast all day long, and all my casts are 68 to 70 feet, 68 to 70 feet. Now occasionally I'll bust out to 90 feet, but I'll bring it back in, and my, my easy cast, my easy cast, with an eight and a half foot rod, I strip in, come up, dry it off, throw it out, shoot it. Now, comes on down, I strip in twice or three times. That leaves a big loop there. Then I come on in twice, hold it. Come in in twice, and hold it. Now, my line's there, pick it up, shoot a loop, pick it up, shoot the whole work. With every cast, there is the expectation of a strike. Averaging three to four casts a minute, Williams will make 600 casts in five hours. And for each, he'll be on as delicately as possible. And for each, he'll be prepared for that sudden, solitary strike. Ordinarily, he will cast at a 45-degree angle from the direction of the stream or from the direction of the wind. And then follow it down and around to keep the line from bellying, from developing a long, slack loop that disturbs the ride of the line and the fly. Williams does not confine himself to one spot or to one fly or to one method of casting. He adjusts to the exotic variables that make salmon fishing so absorbing. It is true of Ted Williams that he gets as much joy out of putting his equipment to the test as he does in catching the fish. Fly casting gives him a special pleasure and the results are gratifying. His preparation and patience have been rewarded. A good size salmon this time. Good job now. As it takes off, Williams instinctively dips his rod to the pull. On the retrieve, he keeps his rod high, lifting it to reduce the drag of the line. The drag on the reel is no more than a pound. Even as he reels in a fighting fish, Williams watches carefully for any breakdown in his equipment. When he reaches the knot at the end of the backing, he checks it closely to see if it's still intact. In the early part of the season, Williams uses larger hooks. The mouth of a salmon then is tender. With a fish so full of spring vigor, three out of four will tear loose from small hooks. An injured fish, though released, can develop infection and die. The battle has drawn an appreciative neighbor, one of Roy Curtis's fellow guides. At this point, William says, he's marveling again that after all this anticipation, it has finally happened. The preparation, the thrill of a perfect cast, the presentation of the fly, the ultimate strike, a series of adventures. No two salmon hit exactly alike. One might come up with a big boil and a giant leap Another might arrive on tiptoes and just barely take the fly in its lips. Williams must now work closely with Curtis to get the salmon to the net. 
He prefers netting because he will release many more than he'll keep, and they are easier to handle and less likely to be injured in a net than on a beach. The fish, tailing now in Windit, makes his last run, but Williams turns him quickly. He cannot go again, and Roy closes in with the net. It's a good-sized salmon, ten and a half pounds, but it's a hen, female, and Williams elects to release it. gingerly removes the hook and turns the winded fish into the river's flow to help it suck up oxygen and regain its strength. The spectator puts up a good-natured objection since a savory meal has been turned away, but this hen will provide many meals later on. In Roy Curtis's practice hands, it is soon back in swimming trim. The day is gone, and with it, the salmon he had hoped for. Ted has released the only good one he has caught, but he knows that there will be other chances. Much of the information he has gathered from the catch and the near misses, he will commit to memory. For his personal record, he will write it all down in a log that he keeps at the cabin. In essence, the log has become Ted's own scientific journal. He stores information on his fishing much in the clinical manner he once used in recollecting the ways and means of the home runs he hit for the Boston Red Sox. He is, in every respect, a scientific angler. Uh, probably more water or getting a cooler temperature. Uh, so your fish different for him uh, at different times of year. And certainly different times of day, really, too. And, uh, and certainly different heights of water, boy. The days in the Miramichi River are measured not in hours, but in thousands of casts for Ted Williams. For him, the love affair is continually stimulated by the pleasure of the river's company and the proximity of his quarry. He perseveres, and he has a reputation for persevering. Eventually, inevitably, Ted will get one he wants. No one knows for sure why a salmon takes the fly. They will do it in the spring when they are voracious eaters. And they will do it even in the fall when they are coming up river to spawn and are not feeding at all. Theories are that they strike partly out of aggravation and annoyance, partly out of instinct. In any case, once he's taken the lure, Salmo Salar is no longer a theory. It is true that you will sometimes catch him in odd ways by a piece of luck on a fouled up fly at an irregular drift. But it's a fish that requires an almost mystic dedication and the most precision an angler can muster. The fight itself is an invigorating exercise, but it's the overall thrill that captivates the angler 
the complete experience. As one prominent fly fisherman has said, there is nothing that will produce greater character than hundreds of hours on a river in the pursuit of Salmo Salar. Salmo's leaps thrill the fisherman. The runs tax his energy. Patience must be exercised. This time, Ted has a fish worth landing. And as the fight nears an end, he and Roy become more deliberate with their actions. It is William's experience that the great majority of salmon are lost at this crucial juncture, when the angler tends to be over-anxious and too quick with his moves. The prize is claimed. This one will weigh close to 12 pounds. It's not a giant by Ted Williams' standards. He has caught Atlantic salmon on a Miramichi that were twice as large. In a season, he'll get as many as 50 salmon and release all but a few. This one has pleased both angler and guy. And with others they have netted for the day, it will make the main course for a minor feast. The quest for now is over. I don't know one guy that doesn't say, yeah, I have to agree. That if I only have one to fish for, it has to be the Atlantic Sea. 